Jude is a famous song written by the Beatles. It's one of the most beloved songs in all of rock and roll history. Hey Jude is well known all over the planet. The book of Jude in the Bible is one of the least known books in all of the Bible and one of the least favorite books in the Bible. It's only one chapter long and it's filled mostly with warnings and harsh sayings. Uh, nevertheless, it's an important book. It's an important book because of what Jude wanted to say to the church. Here's the setup, and then I'll explain to you where we're going. Jude and 2 Peter are very, very similar. So in a sense, this is really an extension of the series on 2 Peter. Uh, if you read the two books back to back, you'll, you'll notice an echo, um, a sense of the same things being said. Um, we don't know if that's because Jude and Peter were writing at the same time and they both had access to the same information, or if one of them uh, wrote knowing about the others. What I think might have happened, and this is just a guess, is that Peter wrote his letter. And as we said, that was the last thing that Peter was going to say before he died. In it were filled certain warnings about how the church was going to carry on after he was gone. Jude took that letter and realized that there was a whole other group of people that needed to see it, that needed to hear this information. So he incorporated Jude, uh, Peter's letter. He kind of um, rewrote it and sent it out to another group of people. Um, so we're going to start by looking at who Jude is and who his audience is and then what his big warning to the church is really all about. And that's only going to take up the first four verses of this one chapter book. First it says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. A brother of James if Jude is the brother of James, there's really only one James that that probably connects to. One James that he could have said, I'm the brother of James, and everybody would know what he was talking about. That would be James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, Peter, James, and John were the inner circle of Jesus' uh, disciples. But that James died soon after uh, Jesus' resurrection. He was one of the first leaders martyred. The more famous James was the one who had been a brother of Jesus, another son of Mary and Joseph, and uh, became one of the central leaders of the, the early church. That James wrote the book of James. So now Jude says he's a brother of James, which means he's also a brother of Jesus. Yet he doesn't call himself a brother of Jesus. He doesn't say, hey, I grew up with Jesus, and now here are some things I want you to, to know about. Um, why wouldn't he say that? You would think that in our world, that would be a greater claim to fame. But Jude knew that being a biological follower, being a biological brother of Jesus, didn't make anybody, didn't make him anybody special. What did make him special was that he was a slave or a servant of Jesus Christ. That's what it says. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's the Greek word doulos, and it means bond slave. It means I am completely reliant upon and completely devoted to Jesus the Messiah. So think about this for a moment. Um, Jesus' brother, his inner circle family, um, were very skeptical of him during his lifetime. In fact, during our season uh, series on interrupting Jesus, we saw one of the times where Jesus' mother and brothers were outside the house when Jesus was inside teaching and they were wanted to take control of Jesus because they thought he was losing his mind. Um, nevertheless, they became followers of Jesus. And most people suspect that what happened was, after the resurrection, Jesus' brothers went from being uh, unbelievers to believers. And so for Jude, it wasn't a big deal that he had grown up in the same household as Jesus. What was important was the, he was a follower of Jesus, he was a bond slave of Jesus, he was a servant of Jesus. In the Bible, the term servant of the Lord is a big deal. Moses called himself a servant of the Lord. David called himself a servant of the Lord. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, the one who was to come would be the servant of the Lord, who would lay down his life for the nation. So to be a servant of the Lord uh, was a really big deal. And that's what Jude was saying is that I am a servant of the Lord, but instead of saying a servant of the Lord the way Moses did, he said a servant of Jesus Christ, which tells you, um, without even trying really, 
how Jude feels about Jesus. This is one of those, this is one of those little places where the Bible points to the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus is God the Son without really trying. A phrase like the servant of the Lord being turned into the servant of Jesus Christ, along with what's written down in verse 4, shows you that the church just saw Jesus as the Lord God. It didn't have a well-worked-out theology. They didn't use a term like the Trinity, but they saw Jesus as the Lord. So here's Jude, and he says, I am the brother of James, but more importantly, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, who's he writing to? He says, I'm writing to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. He says, mercy and peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So who's Peter's audience? Peter's writing to other followers of Jesus. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to the church. And he calls them those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Let's think about that as a definition of who we are as followers. He says, we've been called, which means that our salvation was first God's idea before we even ever thought about it. We were called to be followers of Jesus. It was in God's mind, in eternity past, as theologians say, God decreed that we would hear the message of Jesus and respond. We are called people. Our salvation was his idea before it was our idea. And so in our past, we are called. In our present, we are loved. We are loved. And notice it says, who are loved in God the Father. Um, Meaning that, in a sense, God's love envelops us. We are people who are in God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And we are loved because we belong to God. We're his possession. We are enveloped by God's love. The main defining factor of our lives is that we are loved by God. And because of that love, we are kept for Jesus Christ. This points to the doctrine of God keeping us or holding on to us throughout all of our lives. In the famous hymn where it says, uh, Amazing Grace, he says, "'Tis grace has kept me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. What that's pointing to is that God's great love for us is why we don't fail. It's why we don't fall. It's why we know that we will make it through this life faithfully because God is holding on to us. So in a letter where Jude is going to give them a lot of warnings and where he's going to really kind of uh, declare a lot of condemnation on false teachers, in the midst of all of that, His opinion of them is very solid. His opinion of them is that you are loved by God, you are called by Him, and you will be kept by Him. And uh, which is important because there are big problems on the horizon in the church. His prayer for them is mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Well, here's why he's writing in verse 3. Jude, this servant of Jesus, to these loved people in God. He says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and to urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Once again, we see the urgency that Peter was feeling. The the generation of those who had seen Jesus' earthly ministry were dying off. That first generation of apostles, Peter and Paul and John, James, uh, were dying off. They were being martyred uh, as the political current turned against them. They were dying of old age. Uh, They were not going to be around. And there was a sense that that, uh, if the church was going to survive, it would be because God was holding on to them. 
and that God was going to see them through. Because what was happening was there were false teachers out there in the world. These were people who had consciously slipped in among the church and were, were really using the church for their own personal uh, power. They were using the for church for their own personal agenda. Um, he says, and you have to be aware of this. He says, individuals whose condemnation was written about have secretly slipped in among you. And he says, you must contend for the faith. Each generation has to receive the faith that was passed on from the generation before. Each generation has to receive the truths of Scripture, and we have to hold on to them, and we have to contend for them in a world of many voices. We have to do this no matter what, but especially because there are always people who are going to get in the church and use the church for their own agenda. Um, so Peter tells them, contend. Fight for the faith. Know what you believe and make sure you're holding on to the faith. The temptation is always this, that will add to the faith or that will take away from the faith. In the first century, both these things happened. In the book of Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul writes a whole chapter about how the resurrection of Jesus had to have happened. If it doesn't happen, there is no faith. And that's because some people wanted to say, hey, we want to be followers of Jesus, but we don't really believe in a literal resurrection. Peter, Paul says, we have to believe in a literal resurrection. In the same way in 2 Peter, Peter says, there are people out there who don't believe that Jesus is coming back. They say, hey, we want to follow Jesus. We just don't want to believe that he's coming back and that he's going to judge. You have to believe that he's coming back. He said he would come back. And so you have to contend for that. In the same way, there were people who believed that there were things that should be added to the faith. The most famous in Paul's day were those people who felt um, that we want people to become followers of Jesus and we want them to be culturally Jewish. We want them to keep the cultural markers. We want them to eat kosher. We want them to keep Sabbath. We want them to be circumcised. They should become Jews and then become Christians. So they... They, they, were, they were twisting the faith by making it about one particular culture and about Jesus. And so Paul had to contend for the faith. He had to say, no, people don't have to become Jewish. They can be followers of Jesus in their own culture. So every generation needs to hold on to the faith. They need to contend for the faith because ungodly people are going to slip into the church and uh, pervert it for their own means. Now, as much as I've said that there are certain things people want to add to the faith and certain things that people want to take away from the faith, most of what Jude says in the rest of his letter is that God sees people's hearts and he will judge those who are uh, sneaking into the church to use it for their own immoral gain. And he doesn't really tell us a whole lot about how they veer off doctrinally. What he tells us is how they veer off morally. And so he says here in verse 4, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. So in other words, he says, the doctrinal issues are going to change from generation to generation. You need to contend for the faith, making sure that people don't make it Jesus plus or Jesus minus. And it might be hard to know exactly what's happening doctrinally. But one of the things that you can see is that while these people say the name of Jesus, they deny him with their life. In particular, they use the grace of God as a license for immorality. And so what Peter's going to say in the rest of his letter is that while the doctrinal things will change, the one thing that you'll be able to see is that if a person is a follower of Jesus, you should see it in their life. When you see immorality happening in their life, you know that they are not really followers of Jesus. They are denying him, their sovereign and Lord, with their life because their behavior shows that Jesus is not their Lord. And so Peter, or Jude, who calls himself a servant of Jesus, says that ultimately the false teachers are not servants of Jesus because in their life you can see that they're in charge of their life. Their appetites, their ambitions, their pride, 
their immorality, that's what's in charge of their life, not Jesus, uh, the sovereign and Lord. And so doctrinal issues will come and go. We always have to pay attention to those things. But one real truth is that when people want to be leaders in the church, you should be able to look at their lives and see that Jesus is there, that they are sold out to him. And when you look at them, you should see Jesus. That's Peter's, that's Jude's big warning to us as he starts his letter.